Lesson 31, The Pythagorean Theorem and Irrational Numbers. In the last lesson, we learned that the inverse of a power is a root. And the only bad thing about inverse operations is they usually make things more complicated. Remember earlier when we went over negative numbers? We talked about how mathematicians at first got stumped by equations like this. x plus 7 equals 4. They were wanting to undo this with subtraction because subtraction is the inverse of addition. But that got them into negative numbers because you end up with x equals 4 minus 7. Why don't you just put in the answer to this? What's 4 minus 7? That's right. You see, the answer comes out negative. And so it was really the inverse operation of subtraction that led mathematicians to create negative numbers. And then multiplication has division for its inverse. Division also creates some complications because when you use division to undo even a simple equation, something like this, 5x equals 3, look what happens. We divide both sides by 5, and we end up with an answer that's a fraction. And then everybody knows that fractions are more complicated than simple whole numbers. And so it was the inverse operation of division that caused mathematicians to come up with the concept of fractions. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, a root is an inverse operation. And when mathematicians started trying to solve equations by undoing them with roots, they got into some complications. And actually, it caused them to have to create a new kind of number, a new category of numbers, just like they created negatives and fractions before. And there's a story behind how all of it happened that's kind of interesting. Let me just give you a little history. A long time ago, there was a group of mathematical geniuses living in Greece. The ancient Greeks were brilliant thinkers, as you probably know. This group, though, called themselves the Pythagoreans because their leader's name was Pythagoras. The Pythagoreans were the discoverers of one of the most famous equations in all of mathematics, which you've definitely studied, the Pythagorean Theorem. And just to refresh your memory on the Pythagorean Theorem, it applies to all right triangles. And those are just triangles that have a right angle, a 90 degree angle. And let me just put one on the notepad. And remember in a right triangle, the longest side is called the hypotenuse. And then these two short sides also have a special name. Can you remember what these are called? I'll give you some choices. That's right, it's coming back to you. So every right triangle has a hypotenuse and two legs. And then here's what the Pythagorean theorem says. It says if you take the two legs and square them and then add those squares together, this total has to equal the square of the hypotenuse. That's the Pythagorean theorem that this group of geniuses came up with. And amazingly, it will work on any right triangle, no matter what its shape is, as long as it's got a right angle, as long as it qualifies as a right triangle. And the Pythagorean theorem is used all the time in math and science. It's extremely practical. For example, let's just go through a, a simple case. If you were measuring something, let's say you wanted to know the distance between these two points. Maybe you're looking at a map or something. Basically, what you're trying to do is to calculate the length of this line segment then. And what if you already knew that this distance here was 4 miles and that this distance was 3 miles? Well, if you had that information, here's what you could do. You could create a right triangle out of this. See, when we draw in line segments, this is a right angle here. And so this is a right triangle. And we already know the lengths of two of the triangle sides. And so to come up with the distance between our two points, basically we have to find the length of the third side of the triangle. And actually these are the legs of this right triangle. And then the missing side is the hypotenuse, the longest side. And by the way, you can always find the hypotenuse in a right triangle because it's always on the opposite side from the right angle. So here's the right angle, and then the hypotenuse is over here on the opposite side of the triangle. But here's the main point. We can find the third side of this triangle, and that's the distance between our two points, by using the Pythagorean theorem. 
according to the theorem, the square of the two legs added together has to equal the square of the hypotenuse. And so all we have to do is put in 3 and 4 for the legs. Why don't you do that? Yes. Now we've got an equation with just one unknown, and it's the hypotenuse. And we could even just change it to x. And now we just solve the equation for x. Let's simplify on the left side first. What's 3 squared plus 4 squared? Good. And I'm going to flip the equation around just because we're used to having the x on the left side. That's where we normally see it. And now to finish solving, we just need to undo this square of x. And since powers and roots undo each other, we can just take the square root of x squared. Only we've got to take the square root of both sides. We don't want to violate the golden rule of algebra. And what does that leave us with on the left side? You got it. Now what's the square root of 25? Exactly. That means the hypotenuse must have a length of 5, and so on our triangle, the distance between these two points must be 5 miles. But that's an example of how you can use the Pythagorean theorem to solve a distance problem. It's a really practical theorem. You can use it for all kinds of things. I was telling you about the Pythagoreans, though, giving you a little historical background. After they discovered the Pythagorean theorem, they were working with that equation, using it on right triangles, and they came across this really simple right triangle, where both of the legs have a length of 1. And the Pythagoreans wanted to calculate the length of the hypotenuse here, which seems like it would be a really simple problem. And so they set up the equation using leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. And why don't you just put in the side lengths that we already know? That's it. And I'm just going to use x for the hypotenuse, since that's what we're solving for. And now let's solve this. We can simplify the left side. Why don't you do it? Good. And the next step is to undo the square by taking the square root of both sides. And I'm not going to even bother flipping the equation around. You don't have to do that. When we undo, we end up with this. And what does that leave us with on the right? Yes. And when the Pythagoreans got to this last step, they thought, well, this is easy. We've just got to find the number that when you square it equals exactly 2. That's the square root of 2. And since they were mathematicians, they wanted to get an exact answer. Turns out, though, that that's not as easy a task as you might think. And to show you, let's just do a little bit of testing. The answer can't be 1 because 1 squared, which is just 1 times 1, that equals 1, not 2. And so see, 1's a little too small, but 2 doesn't work either because 2 squared equals 4, and that's too big. And so basically the answer has to be somewhere between 1 and 2. And the Pythagoreans at this point were thinking, well, it's got to be some fraction or decimal in that range. And so they started looking, just testing out different numbers. But no matter how hard they tried, they could not find a fraction or a decimal between 1 and 2 that when you square it comes out to equal exactly 2. They got close, but they couldn't get it exact. For instance, one number that's close is the decimal 1.41. And why don't you just punch 1.41 squared into your calculator? Or you can do it as 1.41 times 1.41. But just put in the exact answer that you get. Yes. See, it's not quite right. 1.9881 is close, but it's a little low. So 1.41 is not equal to the square root of 2 exactly. Here's a fraction that's pretty close. 22 fifteenths. I won't make you do the arithmetic on this one. I'll just do it for you. But if we square 22 fifteenths, it comes out to this. 484 over 225. And this is actually a little bit too high, because if you convert it to decimal, it comes out to about 2.151 something. And that's above 2. So 22 fifteenths is not exactly equal to the square root of 2 either.
The Pythagoreans just kept working and working like this to try to find the exact answer until finally one of the smartest guys in their group got the idea that maybe there's no number, no whole number, no fraction, no decimal, that's exactly equal to the square root of 2. And he must have been extremely smart because he then went on to do a mathematical proof showing that that was the case. He proved mathematically that there's no whole number, fraction, or decimal that will work. And it was a huge deal to the Pythagoreans. As mathematicians, they couldn't believe it. I mean, how could that be? It seems like eventually you'd be able to find some fraction or decimal between 1 and 2 that would work. Anytime you have two fractions, no matter how close together they are, you can always find a fraction between those. And then for decimals, you can always have the digits just go out farther and farther and get closer and closer to some number. But nothing, it turns out, equals the square root of 2 exactly. And what made things even worse for the Pythagoreans is that there are a lot of roots that are like this, that don't have exact answers. Here are a few others. Square root of 3. You can't find a fraction or a decimal that is exactly equal to the square root of 3. And you can't do it for the cube root of 5, or the fourth root of 6, or the fifth. And it turns out there's actually an infinite number of roots like this. And the main reason that the Pythagoreans were so upset is they had a theory that everything in the universe could be represented by numbers. Every length, every quantity. To them, numbers included whole numbers, fractions, and decimals. That's all they knew about. So what they had discovered is that even simple lengths, like the side of a triangle, couldn't be represented exactly by any number. And that basically blew their whole theory. And according to legend, the Pythagoreans decided not to tell anybody about all of this. They just wanted to keep it a secret. And then supposedly they took the smart guy who had done the proof, they took him out on a boat and threw him overboard. Just to make sure that nobody would ever know. And we don't know if that's what really happened, but that's the legend. And all of this actually had a big impact on mathematics because eventually people found out about the discovery. They found out what the Pythagoreans had discovered, and it made other mathematicians, believe it or not, it made them think that numbers were not reliable. So instead of using numbers, mathematicians decided to use only lines and shapes. They used geometry, basically. And for over a thousand years, all serious mathematics was done with geometry rather than with arithmetic or algebra. And it really held back the discoveries in math because nobody was using numbers. Now today we know that the Pythagoreans didn't find some deep flaw in numbers. There's nothing wrong with numbers. They had basically discovered a new kind of number that they didn't understand. It was really a lot like what I showed you at the beginning of the lesson, the equation x plus 7 equals 4. Somebody had to come up with negative numbers to serve as solutions to equations like this. Well, the same thing had to happen with equations like x squared equals 2. Modern mathematicians call roots like square root of 2 or square root of 3 or third root of 5. They call them irrational numbers. That's the name. It doesn't mean crazy or anything. It just means that these numbers cannot be written as a ratio. And ratio is just another word for a fraction. And then a fraction is the same thing as a decimal. And actually, even whole numbers can be considered fractions because you can put any whole number over 1 and turn it into a fraction. So irrational numbers are a new category of numbers that are different from whole numbers, fractions, or decimals. Here's the formal definition. Irrational numbers are numbers that cannot be written as whole numbers, fractions, or decimals, and that's whether the decimal is repeating or terminating. And the way to treat an irrational number when it comes up, when you're solving an equation, is if you want to write the answer exactly, you have to just leave it as a root. There's no simpler way to write square root of 2 than just square root of 2. And so the exact length of the hypotenuse of that right triangle we were looking at is just square root of 2 inches or feet or whatever the unit is. Now even though we can't write irrational numbers exactly as whole numbers, fractions, or decimals, we can estimate them in one of those forms. So for instance, if you weren't worried about being exact, you could just say that the length of that hypotenuse, instead of using square root of 2, you could just say 
it's about seven fifths or it's about 1.4. Remember 1.41 was actually pretty close to square root of two. So 1.4 isn't that far off either. And that might be close enough if you're trying to solve a practical problem or something. Maybe your answer doesn't need to be exact. Nobody's going to go to the store and say, I want square root of two quarts of milk. Make sure it's exact. But that's what most people do on practical problems. When the answer comes out irrational, they just estimate it. Now, in the old days, there was a really complicated way of estimating. You had to work it out with pencil and paper and a lot of steps. But today we can get an estimate just by punching the root into a calculator. And it's important to understand that when you punch in something like square root of 2, the calculator is not giving you an exact answer. If you try to make a decimal equal an irrational number exactly, the digits will just keep going and going. They'll never end. And it won't repeat in any kind of a pattern either. It won't be like 0.33333 or something. And so the technical definition of an irrational number that's used a lot of times is it's a non-repeating, non-terminating decimal. Why don't you use your calculator to estimate the square root of 2 out to five decimal places? five places to the right of the decimal point. I don't know how many places your calculator will show, but it'll probably show at least that many. And remember this little squiggly sign here, this stands for approximately equal to, but go ahead and enter in your estimate. That's right. And so 1.41421 is close to square root of 2, but it's still not exact. And if you want to see that, prove that to yourself, just clear your calculator, then punch 1.41421 in to the calculator and square that. And you should get 1.9999 something. So see, our estimate's actually a tiny bit low. Another important thing to understand is not all roots are irrational. Take square root of 4. This is a root. What does this equal? Why don't you just go ahead and put it in? That's right. Square root of 4 is exactly equal to 2. That's not an estimate. If you square the number 2, you're going to get 4 exactly. And so we say square root of 4 is a rational root because it can be written as a rational number. You can just write it as 2. And then remember, a rational number, the definition is it's a whole number, fraction, or decimal, and it can be either positive or negative. Here's another example, though, of a rational root, square root of 25. And that's because this is exactly equal to the whole number 5. And the cube root of 8 is also a rational root. Why don't you just enter in what this equals? Yes. Since 2 is the exact answer and 2 is a rational number, we know that cube root of 8 is a rational root. And there's actually an easy way to tell whether a root is irrational. Turns out if a root has a whole number under the radical sign, like all of these roots that we've been working with, and there's no whole number answer, if the answer is not going to be a whole number, then you know automatically that the root has to be irrational. So square root of 4 has a whole number answer, 2. That means it's not irrational. But take something else like square root of 10. We know square root of 10 is not exactly equal to 3 because 3 squared equals 9, and that's too low. But then it's not equal to 4 either because 4 squared equals 16, and that's too high. And so we know the answer has to be somewhere between 3 and 4. Well, that means the answer is not a whole number, and then from that we know that square root of 10 has to be irrational. And I'll let you do one. Here's the question. Is square root of 7 irrational? That's right. It has to be irrational because it doesn't have a whole number answer. The answer is actually somewhere between 2 and 3. See, 2 squared equals 4, and that's too low. And then 3 squared equals 9, which is too high. 